Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Wilsmann. I'm the director of the LBI Institute, London. I'm very happy to welcome all of you, whoever you have joined us, be, be, be this from Germany, from South Africa, from the United Kingdom, or from Israel, to tonight's lecture. Tonight's lecture is part of the LBI, the Leo Beck Institute Lecture Series 2022, Popular Culture, Politics, and Jews. Let me give you first some technical advice for this online event. To give you the best possible access to the talk, please select full screen, and then we would advise you to activate the mode show active speaker video as shown in the slide you are seeing now. You can select this option by clicking on the top bar of the frame that is showing windows with the participants. And there you will see, there you will see three options. Click on the white icon in the middle. Please note that you also have the option to enlarge the speaker window by pulling the left bottom of this frame down. These actions will only alter the view on your screen so you can adjust the size of the speaker window at your own convenience during the talk. Our lecture series, the Leo Beck Institute lecture series, is organized jointly by the LVI and the German Historical Institute London. I'm therefore very happy to give way to Dr. Michael Scheich, the Deputy Director of the German Historical Institute London. Michael. Yes, thank you, Daniel, and a good evening and a warm welcome to this event on behalf of the German Historical Institute London. And it's great that you could join us tonight, um, and I think you will um, be able to listen to a really interesting lecture. We have been hosting this um, lecture series for a number of years now, and I want to thank Daniel and his team for the excellent cooperation over the years. It has always been a pleasure hosting these um, events, this lecture series. And I only regret that we that I can't welcome you in our rather splendid conference room on Bloomsbury Square. But um, um, I think in, a, in the not too distant future, we will go back to live uh, and or hybrid events. And um, then we can um, also enjoy a glass of wine after the lecture and during the reception. But um, that's for the future. Um, I also want to welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Lisa Schoss from the Selma Stern Center for Jewish Studies in Berlin. Um, thank you very much for accepting the invitation, Lisa. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And the lecture series has been, I think this, the current lecture series has been really um, interesting. And um, your topic and your lecture um, will throw new light on, on the general theme from a, yet another angle. So I'm really looking forward to what you're going to tell us about um, East German television and the representation um, of Jews in, in various um, East German films and, and um, programs. So thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. And I don't want to take up too much time now. And I hand back to Daniel, who is going to introduce Lisa in, in more detail now, I think. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Michael. And my thanks go also out to you and your team, the German School Institute. It's always, it's really an honor and also a super pleasure, as you would say in Swiss German, super pleasure to work with you. And we really barely miss not being at your splendid house. And we hope next time when Lisa will come, we will be there and not just on Zoom. It's just so beautiful there. And we look forward to come back to the house, maybe next year or maybe already in the autumn time. Our topic, popular culture, politics and Jews is a real challenging topic. It has to do, of course, with politics, but also, as you would see, as you will see tonight, with emotions. It has to do with images. It has to do with fantasies about Jews, but also about Judaism, especially this will be a topic of tonight's lecture, images about Judaism. And it's also about how do Jews talk about themselves? 
And as I mentioned just before, tonight's lecture is really an extraordinary case in point for all of that. I'm therefore very, very pleased to introduce tonight's guest lecturer, Dr. Lisa Schoss. Lisa Schoss is associated with the Selma Stern Center for Jewish Studies in Berlin, Brandenburg. And she's also a member of the research network German Jewish Film History and the Federal Republic of Germany. And there she's in charge of East Germany, if I may say so, in charge of East Germany. Lisa's main research areas are German Jewish cultural history, film and German literature in the 20th century, and history of German Jews and representation of Jewishness, Jewishness, and the Holocaust in film. Lisa is currently working on her first monograph, hopefully to be published next year. And the proviso provisional title is Different Perspectives, the Representation of the Jewish Experience in East German Films. But tonight, tonight, Lisa is going to talk about a story of ambivalent Jewish topics and characters in East German television. So Lisa, please, over to you. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and many thanks for the kind introduction and the invitation to this year's lecture series. I'm honored to be here. The first thought that came to me um, was that this year's title, Popular Culture, Politics and Jews, could just as well be the title of my talk. Today, I would like to talk about Jews in East German television. One focus will be on how Jews and Jewish aspects found their way into East German television entertainment. And television in the GDR was never free of politics. I have prepared a presentation and I will. Start just a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've prepared a presentation of photos and film footage to accompany my talk. Unfortunately, most of the material is um, of very poor quality, which limited the choice, and I apologize for that. Since its beginnings in 1952, East German television had politically been firmly integrated into the centrally controlled state media system. Television was in the eyes of those responsible in the Ministry of Culture, the quote, most important instrument for influencing millions of people. On the other hand, television, precisely because politics had assigned it an agitational function, had to pretend that it offered just a normal television program. It had to meet the viewers' largely apolitical desires for good entertainment, for it could only fulfill its political ideological function to the extent that its media offerings were also used by the viewers. This was especially true when East German television acted as a direct competitor to West German television. The Cold War was also fought over the airways. Entertainment was one of the means to promote acceptance and viewer loyalty. While journalistic programs were unpopular, East German television was quite successful with entertainment, speaking of feature films, multi-part series, the so-called television novels, crime movies, entertainment shows, and festive programs, all at high ratings. Although it has become proverbial that many East German viewers left their country via their screens, East German entertainment television in particular ended up being closer to the everyday life of GDR citizens. 
the program schedule was coordinated with working hours and free time behavior and people could watch their TV stars. Of course, entertainment was by no means apolitical. Television shows provided glamour and international flair, and they showed that socialism had a sense of humor. With television drama, with crime movies and series, larger, exciting narrative arcs with diverse settings were offered, while at the same time, quote, influencing intellectual life in a good sense. At least that's how Walter Ulbricht, the first head of government of the GDR, envisioned it. Entertainment and political education should ideally be thought of together. Stories of transformations, for example, from apolitical citizens to socialist activists were therefore a welcome narrative pattern. Moreover, not only political broadcast formats, but also entertainment programs offered platforms for attacks on the political opponent, the FRG. On the other hand, the strongly political formats also created spaces where politics were absent. For despite all the domination, as in other fields of culture, many programs on television also function according to their own laws in production as well as reception. This set limits to instrumentalization. Stefan Zahlmann has therefore described television and film as seismographs of the political desired but sometimes also unavoidable media culture of the GDR. This ambivalence can also be observed with regard to Jewish characters and protagonists on television. I'm aware of the problem of attributions and the difficult question of what should be attributed to what one can call a German Jewish media history. In this case, I will talk about the level of content and representation, but also about where and how Jewish filmmakers and actors appeared and how they were perceived. In many East German productions, Jewishness was textually submerged, as Ella Schwartz, John Stratton, or Nathan Abrams have argued in other contexts. On the first point, content and representation. Similar to East German film or literature, certain tasks and discourses had formed on television. These included, in addition to persuasion and mobilization, the further development of the so-called anti-fascist line of tradition, the so-called appreciation of the historical role of the working class, the so-called cultivation of cultural heritage, as well as the confrontation with capitalism and imperialism, specifically campaigns against the West and its elites. In accordance with these tasks, tasks, television produced often with the help of the Babelsberg film studios, quite a few programs that not only made Jewish experiences present in a popular medium, it also devoted itself to the so-called Jewish heritage and made Jewishness part of classical entertainment. I will introduce some of these productions to you in the following. Of course, this is only a small section. Dealing with fascist crimes, as they were called in the GDR, undoubtedly took up the largest part of the fictional television entertainment. There was even a separate genre, the so-called anti-fascism films. Jewish experiences figured in one way or another in more than 80 of these television productions, sometimes prominently, sometimes only as an element of the subplot, sometimes merely as an incidental detail. I have listed a few for you here. If you stumble over some of the titles or dates, such as Professor Mamlock or Nackt unter Wölfen, it's because television also produced its own versions of the material, usually before the cinema adaptions. The number of anti-fascism films is much larger, but most of them were about heroic communist resistance. The number of films that made Jewish experience present may nevertheless surprise some people especially because the 80 television productions are joined by almost 50 feature films for cinema, representing Jewish experiences. But there's context that explains these numbers. I can only briefly outline this context here. The fascism and anti-fascism narrative was an essential part of the self-proclaimed first anti-fascist German state. It functioned 
according to certain rules. Firstly, there was a socio-economic interpretation of fascism. Secondly, the emphasis on communist resistance from whose victory, thirdly, the GDR had emerged. <coughs> from this in turn, the SED government concluded that the GDR as a state ruled by communists was not responsible for the Nazi crimes. The anti-fascism films had to support these narratives and therefore certainly served as instruments of East German politics of history and the past. There were weapons in the conflict between FRG and GDR and in underpinning the founding myth of the GDR stabilized the system. But film in general is not a machine made commodity as you all know and propaganda does not always work like it is supposed to do. A multitude of persons are involved in the film's production and approval. This subjective factor contributes significantly, significantly to what is called Eigensinn. This histori historiographic concept became quite popular in the last couple of years among scholars when the GDR is concerned. It focuses on actions and potentialities that had an impact on the sphere of power and domination, stressing the two compounds of the term, one's own sense, own meaning. <clears throat> What was possible in film depended not only on the political climate, but often just as much on the personal constellation. Often those who launched and realized the films combined their own experiences and motives with ideological guidelines. They took a general political mandate and implemented it in their own way, their own sense. They added alternative, in this case, Jewish perspectives to the dominant anti-fascist discourse not least because the filmmakers themselves so both as a natural unity. I would like to highlight just one example here, which along with Jakob der Lügner is probably the most important. Just a brief reminder, Jakob der Lügner was also a co-production of GDR television and the state film studio, Stefa. The film was first broadcast on television in 1974 and was only released in cinema almost six months later and then screened at the Berlinale in the summer of 1975. I would like to refer to the miniseries Die Bilder des Zeugen Schattmann from, from, 1900, uh, from, sorry, from um, 1972. Die Bilder des Zeugen Schattmann meandered between politics and the very personal story of a Jewish survivor in a way that was exemplary for the GDR. The four-part film was based on the novel of the same name by Peter Edel. In the novel about the German past and present, as the subtitle says, Edel revisited parts of his biography as a Jew, as a communist, as a survivor of several concentration camps, as a traumatized person, <clears throat> as a GDR citizen, as a witness in the Glocke trial. The Glopke trial was an East German show trial in 1963 against Konrad Adenauer's Secretary of State in the Federal Chancellery, Hans Maria Glopke. Glopke was co author of the Nuremberg Laws. Schattmann was the first German film to show a panorama of different Jewish experiences, the first to stage a Shabbat in a bourgeois living room, and finally, the first German film that was allowed to have parts of its plot set at the authentic location, the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial, which you can see at the photo. The Schattmann presents, presented the camp as the place of suffering for the prisoners and showed the memorial sites of the 1970s with the relics that had become symbols by then in sunshine and amidst waves, wave, waving grass, grasses. This was very unusual in a fictional television film at that time. Although Schattmann and especially these Auschwitz scenes are among the most impressive things East German television has created, they do not count as entertainment. Just one more remark. Schattmann makes an interesting counterpart to the US miniseries Holocaust. When West German television aired Holocaust in 1979 and in 1982, Schattmann was always repeated on East German television some days before.
The entertainment aspect is more prominent in another East German miniseries, whose plot also ended in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Hotel Polan und seine Gäste, broadcasted in 1982, 10 years after Schattmann. The story of this film was also biographical. Its author was Jan Koppelwitz. The opulent miniseries offered a large ensemble of actors, many different locations, enormous decorations, folklore, music, and emotion. It was directed by Horst Seemann, who had recommended himself as a specialist in Jewish culture since his highly acclaimed film Levinsmühle, based on the novel of the same name by Johannes Bobrovsky. Seemann was not only known for his meticulousness in matters of detail, but he had also a flair for entertainment, the big themes of love and death, atmospheric shots and pleasing forms. While Levinsmühle was about the equally colorful and conflict-ridden coexistence of Germans, Poles, Jews, and Roma in West Prussia during the empire, Hotel Polan was about a Bohemian kosher Grand Hotel whose owners and various guests the film follows over several decades. It captures facets of Jewish life at the beginning of the 20th century, from reform Jews to Orthodox, from German, French, Polish, Czech, patriots to, to Zionists, from horse traders to bankers. From here begins the political maturation process of the young Jew Peter, the third, third generation of the Poland family. It is, of course, his conversion to communism that finally saves him while his mother is murdered in Auschwitz. Hotel Poland was a hit at the time. Even the West German press was full of praise and considered it more important than Holocaust. The film struck a chord with the time in at least two aspects. First, the almost fashionable boom of a reinvented virtually Jewish culture in Europe in the 1980s. The family story in three generations and its Jewish guests offered the opportunity to stage Jewish feasts and tradition in an extended way. An approach to Jewish culture via the edifying, easily consumable, and at the same time exotic sites, so to speak, combined with schmaltzy rom romanticism. The director and the press spoke of, quote, a foreign, mysterious cultural sphere of a long sunken world blown away like grass seeds. Strikingly, there was no mentioning of the culture being destroyed and the people murdered. This also points to the second aspect why Hotel Polan was presumably so successful. The Yidden film, as the production was called among film colleagues, seemed to be about a country before our time. The victims had been moved into distance. The audience got to see a lot of caftans and temple curls, and most of the characters spoke a kind of pseudo Yiddish, all set somewhere between kitsch and caricature. To give you an impression, I would like to show you the scene in which the young heir, Peter, who will later renounce Judaism, is circumcised. Oh, <laughs> Jetzt ist das Kind endlich ein richtiger Jid. Geläubt sei der Herr. However, Hotel Polan is not only problematic because the representation of Jews was folkloristic, but because it reproduced anti-Semitic images. 
The boundaries were already fluid in gesture, mimic, and language, but the linking of being Jewish with wealth and greed or the suggested connection between fascism and Zionism was unmistakable. Broadcast in early 1982, Hotel Poland seemed to herald the anti-Israeli press campaigns in East Germany that began during the Lebanon war. The fact that Hotel Poland simultaneously wanted to contribute to the filmic confrontation with the murder of the European Jews, whether successful or not, is only apparently a contradiction. On the contrary, an attitude was widespread in East Germany that completely separated official commemoration of the murder of the European Jews from often aggressive positions towards Israel. The discourse on Israel in East German television would go beyond the scope here. Nevertheless, it can hardly be separated from the portrayal of Jewish figures as the next example shows. At the end of the 1960s, the SED had commissioned a series about the West German publisher Axel Springer, one of SED's favorite political enemies. Ich Axel Cäsar Springer was one of the most elaborate and costly films in East German television history. The large scale production functioned on the principle of propaganda and entertainment. It was a wild mixture of fact and fiction that was completely opaque to the viewer. On the one hand, the film was overloaded with historical details, people from contemporary history and politics of the day. On the other hand, it teemed with conspiracy theories and methods of the yellow press, scandals, sex, and sensation. An ideological lucrative propaganda brand was created out of the film figure Springer, who could not be questioned by the, questioned by the audience for lack of alternative sources. Not only Springer's media empire and his opinion on the so-called East Zone provoked the SED, but also his loyalty towards Israel. Springer's newspaper, were perceived as catalysts of West German-Israeli relations, as supporters of the reparation agreement and as stimulators of a pro-Israeli climate. Jews played a recurring role in Springer's biography, be it his first wife, Martha Else Meyer, the publisher, Karl Ulstein, the journalist, Rudolf Küstermeyer, his friendship with the CEU politician, Eric Blumenfeld, the Israeli diplomat Asha Ben Natan, or with his closest advisors, Ernst Kramer. They all appeared as characters in the Springer film, as victims of Springer or as Springer's henchmen or string pullers. The script writers have written the biographies to suit themselves and unhesitatingly resorted to traditional Judeophobic stereotypes. I will show you a short scene in which the character Erik Blumenfeld makes an appearance. Blumenfeld, a CDU politician, was a survivor of the Auschwitz and Buchenwald concentration camps, of which the viewer naturally learned nothing. Instead, Blumenfeld, whom contemporaries spoke of as a handsome gentleman, was given an anti-Semitic appearance in the East German miniseries. The figure of Blumenfeld, uses Springer to manipulate the masses, promotes a press monopoly, and is in league with, the, with dictatorships and apartheid regimes. Fascism, capitalism, imperialism, and Zionism formed a logical connection here. Es war man wieder in Hamburg, wo die CDU ihren Parteitag abhielt. Die Krönung für Axel, ein Empfang durch den alten Kanzler. Hamburgs CDU-Chef Erik Blumenfeld hatte ihn arrangiert. Blumenfeld, der Mann Krupps, halb schon Mann Springers, Beauftragter Bonds für die Entwicklung der Beziehungen mit den Staaten Israel, Spanien, Portugal und Südafrika. Erik Blumenfeld präpariert seinen Schützling. Bald wird er Axel Cäsar mit Haut und Haaren gehören. In diesen vier Punkten zusammengefasst tragen Sie dem Kanzler ganz einfach sein persönliches Programm in das der CDU vor, als das Programm Ihrer zukünftigen Welt. So allerdings, als würden Sie Dr. Adenauers Programm nicht kennen. Wenn Sie sich daran halten, würden Sie es schon. Und immer locker bleiben, also wenn Sie nervös werden, bringe ich ein. Sie gestatten doch, Herr Blumen. Verzeihung, ich glaube, es ist besser, springen wir für das Gespräch allein. Der Kanzler liebt schlichte Natur.
Nevertheless, the presence of Jewish characters on East German television is by no means exhausted in such productions. As already mentioned, Jewish aspects were also an element of classical entertainment art. They appeared in detective stories and literary adaptions of exile authors like Jon Feuchtwanger, Anna Segers, or Arnold Zweig. In television theater, even Yiddish music had a niche. Courtroom dramas and crime movies were among the most popular formats. One of the initiatives here is the so-called East German Jewish star lawyer, Friedrich Karl Kaul. As with many Jewish returnees who choose to come to East Germany for political reasons, Kaul's personal and professional interests were combined with the political goals of the communist regime. On the one hand, he was an exponent of SED's politics of history. As a lawyer and joint plaintiff in Nazi trials, he was a key figure in the judicial confrontation with West Germany. On the other hand, he was an exponent of historical enlightenment, at least since the Eichmann trial in which Kaul's joint prosecution plan failed, Kaul published documents about the persecution and murder of the Jews, about anti-Semitism and the euthanasia crimes with great commitment. For a wider distribution, he also used the media. He dealt with it in numerous crime novels and in almost 60 television and DEFA films. It should be mentioned that Kaul also presented instructional programs on radio and television in which he provided information on everyday legal questions. Fragen Sie Professor Kaul, asked Professor Kaul. From the 1950s onward, he worked on historical and recent criminal cases of German judicial history for television, the so-called Fernsehpeter Wals. They added up to a long history of injustice of bourgeois and West German judiciary. Kaul presented the cases with entertaining, partly amusing means. He sat behind a desk introducing the plot, commented on it, and drew a political and moral conclusion. Another example is a television play, Die Vorladung, with which he intervened in the Majdanek trial in West Germany, which had been going on since 1975. The intentions of the film was obvious. Nevertheless, the diagnosis of a delayed, inadequate, and scandalous trial was not untrue. More importantly, the film brought the victim's traumatic experiences back into the public sphere. Other filmmakers also incorporated themes in crime, storage, crime stories whose causes reached back to the 1930s and 1940s and which were connected to the crimes against the Jews. Or the offenses were explained by the virulent anti-Semitism of the present. However, the focus was rarely on the specific crime or offense, but mostly about a devastating analysis of society, West German society, of course, because the plots were always set in West Germany. The crimes, Jewish characters and their experiences were used here as reinforcers of the thesis of the restorative character of the FRG. Nevertheless, as the example Cowles shows, many of these films were made with the participation of Jewish filmmakers or actors, such as Betty Deutsch, Paul Levitt, Betty Löwen, Friedel Novak, Friedrich Richter, Steffi Spira, Peter Sturm, or Jerry Wolf, just to name a few. It was thanks to them that the individual fates of the Jewish characters were explore, explored with psychological precision. Thus, representation also came from the inside. The audience was given something of the ambivalent feelings that survivors felt in the land of the perpetrators. The effect of these films was, of course, an ambivalent one. And here, I don't mean the fact that they were part of entertainment. The diagnosis applies to the same extent to other formats. The films talked about the Nazi past and anti-Semitism, and in a certain way, kept these topics in the viewer's consciousness. But the East German audience got to see the crimes and prejudices of the others, the fascists or the West German incorrigibles. The films were meant to create a feeling of political moral superiority in the East German viewer. This made the films more one-dimensional than they often were. The better ones retained a certain openness. 
It did, however, require a willingness on the part of the viewer to question himself. Despite all the instrumentalization, there were also crime movies that showed an honest interest in the fate of the Jewish characters. For example, the television film Die Gesetzesfalle, broadcast in 1978. The film reconstructed an authentic case from 1939 on the basis of a criminal file in which a Jewish Berlin woman, 68 years old, is charged with prostitution, e.g. racial defilement. The accusation is absurd, but no one wants to testify on her behalf, and so her fate is sealed. In this portrayal of ordinary fascism, no one is really good or evil. Everyone tries to take their little advantage at the old woman's expense. The film received much praise. No one criticized the absent of political explanations. And on West German television, the film was even voted television play of the month. Finally, I would like to approach Jewish aspects in East German television through another two Jewish protagonists. Jerry Wolf, who just as an aside had survived the Nazi era in English exile, was one of the most popular actors in film and television in the GDR. He presented himself to the audience detached from being Jewish, at least for a long time. Jerry Wolf served all genres from comedy, crime movies, children films, anti-fascism films, literary adaptions to Western movies. Wolf sang political chansons hosted the Chess Olympiad and in the 1960s, one of the most popular entertainment shows. The live show from Melodie to Melodie offered a large scale potpourri. The focus was on well-known hits, evergreens, chansons and operetta melodies staged by popular performers in front of changing backdrops and accompanied by the television ballet. On the street, the actor was soon only called Jerry one can't help but think of the West German Jewish entertainer Hans Rosenthal, a popular figure and everyday companion as Anne Giebel has described Rosenthal. I will show you a short excerpt. Unfortunately, it is in very poor quality because there are no recordings of the show in the archives. But I think it still gives an impression of the show. Bizarrely, Wolf sings the popular song Die Nacht ist nicht allein zum Schlafen da. The music was by Theo Makeben, the lyrics by Otto Ernst Hesse. Both worked under film minister Goebbels. The title was first sung by Gustav Gründgens in 1938 in the Jufa film Tanz auf dem Vulkan. <laughs> Whether, when and how Wolf was perceived as a Jew on television is a question that is as interesting as it is difficult to answer. For one can also speak of latent communication. For example, when Wolf sang Yiddish ghetto songs, when he was cast Jewish or when he became a mouthpiece for political messages as a Jew, especially when it came to criticism of Israel. Here, Wolf was not an isolated case, on the contrary. What politics made use of was firstly a biographical factor that was otherwise not explicitly highlighted. And more prominently, the complicated relationship of Jewish communists to Israel, which was burdened with ambivalent emotions. Added to this was the returnees and survivors charged relationship to Germany, their negative fixation on the FRG as an image of a state ruled by former Nazis and the unconditional loyalty to the anti-fascist idea. Lin Yaldati, 
the Yiddish diva of the communist world, as David Schneer has called the Dutch singer who moved to East Germany in 1952, also stood in this field of tension. With her Yiddish programs, Gaddafi not only appeared self-confidently as a Jewess and communist, and thus built bridges between identities and memories that were often presented separately. The state virtually used her as the figurehead of Jewish culture and anti-fascist commemoration in the GDR. She was allowed to travel, playing her role as an ambassador from the other Germany. Like Peter Edel, she spoke in public about the experience of Auschwitz. In addition to music, she was particularly committed to the remembrance of the Jewish resistance and the memory of Anne Frank, which, with which she was imprisoned in the concentration camps Westerborg and Bergen-Belsen. All this also took place on GDR television. With Yaldati's participation, the television broadcasted a program on the 19th anniversary of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It produced an abridged version of Yaldati's Anne Frank program and showed documentaries about Yaldati that were produced by DEFA. Yaldati was invited as a contemporary witness or as guest in music programs such as Musenmühle. Incidentally, <clears throat> Yaldati also appeared as an actress in television films, for example, as a Guatemalan resistance fighter in the mini series Das Grüne Ungeheuer, as you can see here, or as a singer in Zwischenbilanz, a film about everyday socialist life and production. Only the Six Day War forced Yaldati to take a break. Although critical of Israeli politics, she stood in solidarity with the state of the survivors and like many others, refused to sign the official declaration of Jewish citizens of the GDR, which strongly condemned Israeli aggression. Yaldati suddenly received no more engagements for representative events, was cut from the television programs and excluded of the singing movement. It was not until 1975, at the latest after the broadcast of Holocaust on West German television, that Yaldati was rediscovered. Now she even began to build bridges to Israel with her programs in which the whole family now performed. In the 1980s, Yaldati was finally no longer alone with the Yiddish niche she had established. Her daughter, Yalda Riebling, developed her own program. Amateur groups and young people discovered Yiddish folk music and klezmer. Both became the means of expression of a subculture and a means of criticizing state commemoration. At the same time, the state increased its attention to the few remaining Jews in the GDR. Many have spoken of a late laugh to all things Jewish. Jerry Wolf also suddenly appeared on television with a Yiddish program at the end of the 1980s. The grandson of Rabbi cautiously wanted to be it understood as a cultural mission. The program on Wenn der Rebbe lacht was a tightrope walk towards romanticism. For one hour, with a white ruffled beard, Wolf re recited Yiddish songs, jokes, and anecdotes in an acted rehearsal atmosphere. He was accompanied by the young band Aufwind, the first East German non-Jewish music ensemble dedicated to klezmer and Yiddish songs. From today's perspective, the program seems curious in its sometimes deliberate hilarity. I show you the first five minutes, if I have the time. Um, but I must warn you, though, some of the speeches and jokes are a bit misogynistic. So, in dem Moment, wir müssen ja noch, wir müssen ja noch proben. Also hier an der Stelle hier haben wir eine Kamera, ja. 
äh, begrüße ich die Leute. Also guten Abend, liebe, äh, liebe Hausfrauen und so. Und erzähle dir, was wir hier machen. Also äh, Nädeln und, und Lotzelach aus dem jüdischen Kulturkreis. Ja. Und dann hauen wir so richtig rein. Was habt ihr dort? Wir haben uns ja noch ja nicht verkracht, kann aber bald kommen. Also bitte. Lommi, sag über Beten, über Beten, was stehst du bei der Tür? Was stehst du bei der Tür? Lass mir, sag über Beten, gib a kick auf mir. Lass mir, sag über Beten, gib a kick auf mir. Lass mir, sag über Beten, über Beten, stell dem Samovar. Stell dem Samovar, lass mir sag über Betten, sei schön nicht kein Narr. Lass mir sag über Betten, sei schön nicht kein Narr. Lass mir sag über Betten, über Betten, keusche Pomeranzen, keusche Pomeranzen. Lass mir sag über Betten, um dir gehen tanzen. Lass mir sag über Betten. Also im Großen und Ganzen, ja, könnte vielleicht zum Schluss nicht ganz so schnell werden. Man, äh, man verträgt sich ja auch nicht so schnell nach einem richtigen Krach. Apropos Krach, fällt mir doch ganz zufällig folgende Geschichte ein. Äh, zum Rabbi in einem kleinen osteuropäischen Dorf, in einer jüdischen Gemeinde. Das ist übrigens ein ganz wichtiger Mann, der Rabbi, auch Rebbe genannt. Das ist der Mittelpunkt eigentlich für, für den heutigen Abend. Das ist nicht nur der Seelsorger, der Prediger und Priester, das ist auch ein bisschen der Kadi, der äh, schlichtet den Streit und er legt die Gesetze aus und ein. Und also dem, wie gesagt, kommt eine junge Frau, eine neue Familie und weinend und sagt, ja, beschwert sich also äh, ihr Mann, mit dem sie jetzt immer noch bei ihrem Vater lebt, das, äh, die Wohnungsfrage war noch nicht keiner Weise gelöst, äh, ihr Mann und ihr Vater bei dem sie wohnen, die prügeln sie beide. Was, sagt der Rebbe, ist denn das die Möglichkeit? Schick mir doch mal deinen Vater. Sie schickt den Vater hin, der Vater kommt und dann sagt der Rebbe, also ihr prügelt beide, äh, deine Tochter, was äh, soll das? Bei deinem Schwiegersohn überrascht mich das nicht. Sein junger, impulsiver, gehzorniger Mensch, aber du bist doch ein friedfertiger, gütiger, älterer Herr. Ja, sagt der alte Jude, Entschuldige, äh, ich strafe nur meinen Schwiegersohn. Haut er mir meine Tochter, haue ich ihm seine Frau. Ja. Well, Wolf's self-ironic conclusion that evening was, it was a real dress rehearsal. Everything that could go wrong, did go wrong. Well, that's a good sign. In 1990, Wolf tried a second program by dem Rebben ist gewesen this time in front of a young audience. But here too, there was no casual laughter. Wolf never took off his beard after that. In his old age, he called himself the alibi Jew of German television. With this development, Jewish aspects or what was thought to be Jewish aspects had finally found its way into East German popular culture. People 
thought that they had found an approach to Jewish culture that was far removed from Auschwitz and German crimes. People were allowed and wanted to sing, laugh, and dance. Thank you much. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Lisa, for this um, extremely interesting lecture about something which on one hand um, might be familiar, might not be familiar to us, which really has to do with this kind of very unique East German background, where suddenly certain topics like Israel became very predominant which they were not in West Germany for quite a long time until the 60s, totally different today. But it might be, it might have been some kind of pre-runner for certain events we observe today also in West Germany. And this strange mix between human politics, is this just, this is my first question and I open the floor for all of you. Is this just something which is part of Cherry Wolf or did you come across this somewhere else too? I think that's very unique. Yes, I agree. I agree. This is really something characteristic um, for Jerry Wolf, I would say. This special mix mixture of politics and um, humor. And he, he always emphasized that this was his English um, Mm -hmm. uh, his, his English school, that uh, the English had a different approach to, uh, to uh, E and U culture, and uh, I don't know whether this exists in mm -mm. English as well. Um, to, low brow, high brow. Yeah, um, to high and low um, uh, culture, and um, he always emphasized that this should be mixed Jennifer, um, you have um, a question, so I hand over to you. Right, you want me to say it? Yes, yes. I, hello, very interesting. I wondered whether Jewish characters were ever seen on children's television programs. Yes, they were. There were quite a lot of children, um, children, uh, children films who um, either had um, Jewish, topics, I don't like really the word, but um, mm -hmm. uh, plots with um, where Jewish experiences um, were present. And of course, um, the actors as well. But as I said, um, it, it doesn't matter whether an actor is Jewish or not. Um, but there are also film, uh, children's films about Jewish experiences, especially in the 1980s. Let me maybe explain how we run the Q&A session, just to, that we are in the clear, I think I didn't tell you yet. If you would like to ask the speaker a question, please write your name in the chat um, box and press return, but just know your name, not your question, so that we can find you and see that you have a question and then mute you. You see the chat function in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. So just write your name in there, and then I hand over to you. Other questions, please. Can I maybe refer to this first question, which I think is, is super interesting, the kids. Were these appearance of kids also linked to politics or did this change something when you suddenly came across so-called Jewish kids in East German TV? Um, I, I'm not sure whether I, un, uh, I understood the question right. It's the question whether there are Jewish kids in, in um, ch uh, children's TV programs or um, mm, if did you I have... get you right? Yeah. And if, 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 if East German TV was focusing on, on kids, yeah. kids' characters, where then those moments when they, we could see Jewish kids, so to speak, also linked to politics, or did this change the content of it a bit? 
Well, this depends how you define politics. Of course, these children films where you see, uh, where you saw Jewish characters um, were films about the Nazi past. Uh, mm -hmm. So there were anti-fascism films. And of course, um, there's always the link to politics uh, and to education in this, mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in this kind of films. Um, the Jewish experience or the anti-fascism theme um, was included in children's TV program since the 1960s, I would say. I'm, I'm not really an expert on children's TV, so um, I can't really um, say, say something more, but I know that there are films about it and um, I saw at least two of them. <laughs> Um, uh, these were stories where um, a Jewish child comes into a communist family and um, uh, uh, is surviving in this family undercover. Mm -hmm. King has a question. Um, yes, yeah, first of all, um, Lisa, thank you so much for your really exciting talk. Um, I can't wait to read your book next year, fingers crossed. Um, I have got two questions um, that are quite different to each other. So the first one is, um, do you have any insight into audience reactions to the movies and the TV series and the features that you talked about? Um, it would be just really exciting to, whether you, you, you found anything in the archives about the reading of these movies amongst the audience. Um, and you, you touched upon that, that it sometimes doesn't quite fit um how think how films and and tv programs are perceived and what they actually try to convey so that would be really exciting to hear and secondly i was super excited to see so many visuals about maybe not accurately um religious rituals but maybe fantasies about them and interpretations thereof um and i was wondering whether you came across any other depictions of, um, of religious weddings, for example, um, or baptism, which I have not seen. I'm, I must say I've been working on East German TV series about everyday life, and I haven't seen a single Jewish character there or, or a single religious ritual except for one wedding in a series from the late 1980s. So I was wondering whether this is a very unique element of TV narratives about ideas about Jews in GDR television, that the aspect of religion is used in an anti-fascist and ultimately socialist narrative, which I find quite fascinating. So yes, these are my two questions. And thank you very much again for, for your really fascinating talk. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, audience reaction. I always get this question um, and I always have to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> can't tell you very much about that because of course it's a very difficult um, uh, difficult topic um, and you you don't have very much material in the archives um, there are uh, still some um, some um, reactions for example there exist um, yeah concerning hotel Poland for example um, hotel Poland um, uh, yeah, um, was controversially um, uh, by the viewers. The most of the most of the non-Jewish um, audience really liked Hotel Poland and enjoyed all this um, yeah exotic um, uh, images. Um, on the other hand, the Jewish community. Um, uh, yeah, protests against the film, and um, I found one uh, one letter in the archives where two um, party members, Jewish party members, um, protested against the film, and um, uh, with a um, uh, I'm sorry, um, and and they complained that they um, felt remembered um, to the anti-Semitic um, Stürmer or, um, and that this film shouldn't be shown anymore. Um, 
or concerning the Shatman, um, the figure, um, the, the ratings were quite high in comparison to Holocaust, it was quite similar, for example. How the reactions on these popular formats with Jerry Wolf, where I can't tell you really, but um, as I said, Jerry Wolf was a popular actor and everybody knew him. And um, I think for the viewers, it didn't make really, a, it didn't make really a difference whether he um, played in a movie or um, he did the entertainment shows or he did his Jewish program. Um, on the aspect of religion, um, yeah, I totally agree. This is a very special one. And in fact, there are only two films uh, in television where you can see religious aspects of Judaism. The first one is Die Bilder des Zeugen Schatman, where you see in the, um, where you can see a Shabbat in the bourgeois living room. And um, it's very, um, yeah, it's, it's not at all folkloristic. Um, it's no comparison to Hotel Polan. And in Hotel Polan, you have these extended presentation of feasts, a wedding, um, uh, a circumcision, um, and other Jewish uh, traditions. But there are no more, um, no more uh, other images of Jewish religion in East German television or East German cinema. Alexander, you have a question? Yes, thank you so much. Um, you know, thank you for your, for your talk. As you know, I'm a big fan of your work and very much looking forward to the book. Um, now, my question concerns the production, because I know you've looked at the, not just at the movies, but also at the files of how these movies were made. And I was wondering, the, um, the filmmakers and the writers and the producers, um, did they ever reflect on the nature of their audience? Uh, because they must have been aware that they made these movies for a German uh, population, of course, which also meant a post-national socialist audience. So they could expect a very little knowledge about Judaism, um, but, you know, a lot of remnants of propaganda. So did they ever sort of intend this in a sort of educational manner, or did they ever reflect on how things to avoid and what not to do? Yeah, exactly. You are completely right. Yeah, they did. And again, I can... Um, I can um, explain it with the example of Hotel Polan. Um, this is especially interesting because um, this uh, film has a long production history. And at the first place, uh, the film was promoted um, that uh, the film could educate the viewer about Judaism and Jewish life in Europe. And um, then there were um, yeah, different circumstances why the um, project was postponed for a couple of years. And uh, then in yeah, the East German um, television became, or the news came around that the West German television um, will uh, broadcast Holocaust. And then East German responsible, um, responsibles in the Minister of Culture were eager to have um, another project. And um, of course, uh, this couldn't be done so fast as they wanted it to be. And in the end, um, we had the 1980s and the escalation in Israel. And now the film was promoted for his, uh, his depiction of Zionism and um, the connection to fascism. So um, this changed quite a lot. Thanks. So the next question goes to Michael and then to Irena. Yes, thank you very much for your, for your um, lecture, um, Lisa. Um, I've also got two questions. And the first one is, if I didn't, under, if I understood you correctly, 
you said that at least one of the films you discussed was also shown on, on West German television. Um, was this an exception or are the other, exa are the other examples of, 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 of films you, you're looking at that were kind of shown in, Ger in West Germany? And could you say a bit more about how this came about? So was it kind of the personal connection or the personal links between the, between the, um, the people who, who, who produced the film and, and people in, in West Germany or, or um, was this a kind of a more official um, link? And do you know when and where it was shown on West German television? Was it kind of on, on one of the third programs in the, in the middle of the night or so, or was it on primetime television? So it was, would just be, I'm, I'm curious to know how this transfer of the film from, from East to West Germany happened. And the second question um, is just simple. Um, what happened to Cherry Wolf after reunification? Um, was he still kind of in business or was um, or was he kind of sidelined or so what, what happened to him? But thank you very much. Yeah, um, concerning the first question, um, there was a transfer, especially in the 1970s and the 1980s, the programs, uh, the channels exchanged um, uh, more and more programs and films, um, although in an asymmetrical um, relation. Um, there were, of course, more films of the West in East German television than the other way around. Um, I'm uh, unfortunately, I, uh, unfortunately, I cannot say anything about the circumstances. Um, of these transfers. Um, the example I gave with uh, Die Gesetzesfalle, I just know that it was shown in, I think it was a VDR, um, but at which time it was um, aired, I, I, I'm really, I, I don't know. Um, and the second question um, about Jerry Wolf. Yeah, this is quite funny because, um, um, most of, or a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, um, people from GDR, especially um, the Jewish returnees or survivors, um, resigned or fell into melancholy um, over a failed dream after 1989. And um, yes, he was still in business, um, but uh, uh, I said he called himself the Alibi Jew of um, German television, and um, after 1989 he called himself the, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the word, the bum on the job, I, um, the bum, is, is, is this the right word, the, um, uh, like a homeless people, um, he played, um, he was cast for these roles in in German movies and television plays. Irena? You have to unmute yourself, Irena. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I'm quite interested, the only, <clears throat> sorry, my only information actually on that subject comes from Daniela. Daniela Dan, <clears throat> and I wonder whether you, uh, I mean, whether you uh, agree with her stance, you know, her analysis or not. And as to Jerry Wolf, I think <clears throat> he was sidelined actually, because I think he was offered roles in, um, uh, or parts in, in soap operas, you know, and then sort of discarded after a few uh, episodes. But perhaps you could you could um, uh, say something about Daniela Dan's view. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether you know in, uh, what you mean in particular, um, but of course, um, I guess uh, you mean her uh, yeah. opinion that there were, of course, um, the dealing with the past in East Germany, and that you have to take these films and um television dramas seriously and uh, yes uh, uh, i agree on that um i hope this came clear on my talk that um 
you always um, you, you can't say this is uh, all propaganda just because it was produced in a state control uh, media system concerning the film or concerning the television. And of course, there are some outstanding um, television uh, films or cinema movies. Um, for example, um, Die Bilder des Zeugen Schadmann or Jakob der Lügner. Um, or also the film of Konrad Wolf, of course. Um, but this is cinema. Um, yeah, um, which, is, which are really important milestones, I would say, um, in, um, in the filmic uh, representation of Jews and the Holocaust. Elisa, you have a question too? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, my question is uh, just very general. Um, do you know, um, in comparison with uh, the DDR, uh, whether the um, whether the amount of uh, portrayal of uh, Jewish culture was similar in uh, other Eastern Bloc states uh, during during the um, uh, during this time, or do you think the DDR was um, uh, somewhat more proactive uh, with this? Um, well, I'm not sure concerning television, I have to admit, because um, my main um, field of research is cinema, um, and um, I'm not really familiar with the television in Eastern Europe. But concerning cinema, um, of course, there are a lot of um, films in the 1960s and 1970s. And um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, uh, in the 1960s, there, um, there's, uh, there's this worldwide um, increase in films um, of Holocaust and Jews. And um, I argue that the GDR, um, is not, um, is, uh, uh, yeah, um, is also joining these, um, um, these, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just um, losing my words. Um, yeah, the GDR joined this movement of, of film and dealing with the past. Thank you. I would like to come in um, with probably two questions. One has to do with Alexander's question and the other one probably has to do with Michel's question. Um, Hotel Polan is a very unique film. And you mentioned this also, why? <laughs> but Hotel Polan also arises a very difficult to answer question, namely, how do I show Jews on film, right? And German filmmakers in West Germany, East Germany, used to answer this question very differently than their colleagues in France, the UK, or in the States, in a very different way. And I think um, Hotel Polan is a case in point, especially this Brit Mila and the circumcision scene where one of the main actors has an uncanny similarity to Zhu Xu, the figure of Zhu Xu, Zhu, uh, Yu Zhu, 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 Zhu Xu in um, Harlan's film from 1940. So my question is, were there, have you come across in you know, all the papers you have seen, documents or exchange of letters where the filmmakers do discuss this question. How do I bring a Jew on screen? I have, a, I'm a, you know, when I was doing some research on Sterne by Konrad Wolf, I have come across an exchange of letters between him and um, one of his main collaborators about why to choose an actor 
why to prefer one actor, um, or why to give a certain actor a role in the film. It's about Ruth, you know, because for them, she looked more Jewish than someone else. And they also talked about this. What does it mean to look Jewish? Have you come across something like this? For example, um, in the documents about Hotel Polan, that's my, or in other documents, because this shows you a lot about what kind of fantasies were at stake in those times. Mm. And the second question is, you know, if you decide, I put a Jewish marriage on screen, or if I put um, a Brit Mila on screen, I have a certain message to convey. And my question is, what kind of message did they convey? You know, I mean, I mean, everything what they did about the Brit Milan was completely wrong. Everything was wrong, but that's not the point. The point is the message, you know, and what stays behind after having seen the Brit Mila in Hotel Polan is a baby crying. But is this the message? Or did they discuss among themselves what they wanted to achieve? I'm not going to say they want to achieve something bad. Maybe they want to achieve something good. But what, did, what was this all about? Brit Mila, Brit Mila is very, very unfamiliar on screen. Usually it's all about marriages or Shabbat, Friday evening, or um, holiday, you know, Yom Kippur. But Brit Milat, that's really unique. Um, yes, I, I agree. Um, uh, as I said, um, Horst Seemann, the director of Hotel mm -hmm. Polan, um, was really, uh, he was, uh, it was a naive fascination for these feasts and rituals and um, that's why he included so much of it in the film it must be um, it was even more and um, he had he had to cut out some stuff because mm -hmm. it was too much um, and yes I don't think uh, that it happened by chance that he chose the circumcision scene um, because um, as I said, in Hotel Polan, the Jews are the others. Um, uh, they, are, um, uh, they are exotic, they are from a different, um, different time, a different land, and all this added up um, uh, or was like uh, put into a nutshell in this scene of circumcision, I mm -hmm. think. Um, but as I said, um, um, there was also a wedding scene in this in this film. Um, I think I had one picture of it uh, included in the presentation. Um, yeah, and uh, Seemann um, was very meticulous in matters of detail, and um, he uh, cast actors of Jewish theater in Poland. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, um, that's what I know. And he also had some advisors of the Jewish community in Berlin um, for um, the uh, liturgy um, mm -hmm. and Jeez. the singing. And um, yeah, as I said, I think he, he tried to be um, very correct, but of course he was completely um, unreflected uh, reflected um, about what he presented there. You know, yes. my question is not so about not, not not so much about is this authentic or not. This is always yeah. you know when you shoot um, two scenes as part of a fiction film, you do have your advisors, but as a film director, you have to take also your liberties because you are you're producing art. And so what? So so it's not so not so much about authenticism. It's much so much about it's more about um, what kind of message am I going to convey? And, and the Brit Mila is super interesting in terms of sound, you know, these different voices, strange kind of music and the crying baby. So was he, what, I would, I mean, he's a 
very good filmmaker. So he must have been aware of the crying baby. It's not something which is linked to something, to positive emotions when seen on screen. Nobody wants mm. to see a baby crying, right? Mm. Mm. And, and the other thing is, you mentioned this um, to present the Jew as the other. There's no problem with showing some somebody being different, but that's not the problem. The problem is what goes along with being different. Yeah. Was there a discussion about this within among the filmmakers, or were they just? I'm not quite sure if they if you can say they're just naive. Mm -hmm. They understood uh, what they were doing. Uh, there was, in fact, an argument between the author Jan Koplowitz and mm -hmm. uh, the the director, and the author um, complained about these images um, of, like he said, ghetto Jews and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, he wanted to uh, to have pictures of uh, um, Jews who are um, like assimilated and okay. um, are part of European culture. And um, because he didn't get that, he resigned from uh, or, or wanted to have his name excluded from the film from the credits. Um, but this is this is a very difficult story um, with Koplowitz and Seemann because there are quite a lot of um, yeah, contradictions between them. And in the end, nobody wanted to be responsible for the um, images we saw on the screen, especially these anti-Semitic uh, um, images and um, the connection between fascism and Zionism. Um, and um, the director, um, is dead uh, and Koplowitz um, and the dramaturg, uh, yeah, were always um, saying that the other one is responsible for this kind of images they produced. So we don't know in the end who was responsible for that, but um, still um, there was a discussion, but we don't know. <laughs> I mean, we just we had just have the film, and we know that the discussion obviously um, didn't have any impact on the film. May I ask another question? Because what you have just told us is super unusual, fascinating. You know, nobody wants to be responsible for the images, and that's extremely unusual. Artists normally claim their images, and that's I've not heard. I never. I mean, that's really a very peculiar story that at the end, everybody says, no, it's not me. Have you come across similar conflicts in other productions dealing with Jewish images in the GDR? Well, not, not in television. Um, uh, I found this uh, a similar, um, a similar problem um, with the film Lebende Ware, um, um, a cinema production in the 90, uh, from 1966 mm -hmm. um, about the um, yeah the last etap um, of the Shoah in Hungary, and there was also an anti-Israeli dimension in this film, and the author was again Friedrich Karl Kaul, and um, he uh, in his expose for the film he stressed that one has to be careful to um, connect Jews um, with money and um, uh, yeah, that this is a difficult question and um, um, we have to, or the filmmakers have to be um, sensitive with that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they produce exactly these kind of images. They, um, they wanted to avoid. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. So there's still a lot of open questions out there, but super fascinating. Are there any other questions? Shaila, you seem to be thinking. No questions from your side? Okay, if there are no more questions, so I would like to bring the official part of our Zoom event to an end. And my thanks go really out to Lisa 
it's really a think provoking topic super interesting and very unique and i'm very much looking forward to your book and hope you're all going to buy the book so um i say good night to all of you and we will continue um our lecture series in october with a topic on a very famous Israeli authors who became a superstar in West Germany. So I hope to see you in October, maybe at the German Soul Institute, maybe Zoom on Zoom, again, depending on the situation. Let's cross a finger that we meet really. Good night and hope to see you soon again. <laughs>